Hi, and welcome back to the next chapter book club. I'm Brianna. Uh, if you're new, the next chapter book club is a book club that is focused on middle grade reads. Those are reads for ages nine to 14, which is a pretty big age span, and we try and cover it all uh, with our variety. This month in April, April is National Poetry Month, so this month I decided our theme would be unusual narrative structures. So some of this has to relate directly to poetry and some of it is a little bit different. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first read this month uh, was Jazz Owls, a novel of the Zoot Suit Riots. And that is by uh, Margarita Engel, um, which I'm going for an arrangement by historical period this time. Um, so starting with not necessarily the oldest in historical periods, but a historical fiction novel. This particular one, Jazz Owls, is told in verse. Um, so we've got a variety of different um, verse poem types. Some are shorter, some are longer. And this one alternates between three perspectives. So you have two sisters, Lorena and Maricela and their brother Ray. And they each have a different perspective on the same events. This one is based in fact. It does have some historical facts about the Zoot Suit Riots, including real historical people. Um, but the three main characters are fictionalized. Uh, the two sisters, they work in a factory during the day in dance in US USO halls at night. It's supposed to be like a morale boost for the troops. And their brother Ray it also dances in the USO. He's a typical zoot suitor. So he has the really big garb of the zoot suit that gives him a lot of confidence. Um, and it's just uh, about this period in American history and how these, this family in particular works their way through this period of time and comes to terms with the historical ramifications of the Zoot Suit Riots or the Sailor Riots. So to give you a little bit of a hint, I did not tell you about the AR level yet for this one. This one is rated 6.8 and is worth two points. I'm gonna read a little bit for you um, about from the beginning, just to give you a hint of what this is like so we'll read the first verse poem called Jazz Craze. This is in the voice of Maricela, who is 16. The musicians call us owls because we're patriotic girls who stay up late after work all day so we can dance with young sailors who are on their way to triumph or death on distant ocean waves. I love feeling jazz winged, so this owl life is easy for me until early morning when my shift at the cannery begins right after a long journey of clanging streetcar bells and sleepy smiles. All those memories of dancing the jitterbug, lindy hop, and jump blues while adding my own swaying bit of Latin swing rhythm. So that kind of gives you a hint, at least into one of the voices. I think that Margarita Engel does a really good job of making each of the siblings' voices very unique in this novel, and you definitely know who you're reading about. If your kiddo really enjoyed Jazz Owls, I think that they will also enjoy Riot by Walter Dean Myers. Uh, Riot is also an unusual narrative format. Instead of a verse uh, poetry setup, it's set up as a screenplay. Um, and it also uses multiple perspectives and, like I said, the atypical format of a screenplay to explore ideas of race, class, and violence using, using U.S. history as a backdrop. I think they'll also like Out of the Darkness by Ashley Hope Perez. And that also uses real U.S. history as a backdrop to explore teen lives, just like Jazz Owls. All right, so our next one, Jazz Owls is a little is geared towards a little bit of an older audience. Our next one, Countdown by Deborah Wiles, is definitely right kind of in the middle of that middle grade audience. It is level 4.4 and is worth nine points. This one. Also, it has a different type of unusual narrative structure. This one is deemed a documentary novel. So in the novel, Deborah Wiles has put in real photos of people during this time period. This one's set in 1862. Comics from the time period, ads, um, 
different sporting events, music lyrics, all kinds of stuff to really kind of immerse the reader in this time period. So Countdown is about a young girl named Franny and this is during the Cold War. So at her school they have a lot of Cold War drills and that's kind of where that image I showed you of this turtle comes in. Um, they're supposed to follow Bert the turtle and do what he does and duck and cover and find any way you can cover yourself. So they, it's a lot of kind of tension and paranoia. Franny's family is also a military family. They do live off base, but their dad is part of the Air Force and he kind of flits in and out of the novel. Mostly it's told through the voice of Franny who is trying to navigate her world in time of this great tension of the Cold War, but also tension in her family. Her oldest sister, Joellen, is trying to strike out and be on her own and achieve more freedom. Uh, she's going to college and she has a lot more radical ideas than her parents. And so it's a lot of kind of trials and tribulations of what life was like in 1962. Uh, I really enjoyed this one as well, just like Jazz Owls. It was very different. I enjoyed all of the historical extras in form of speeches by JFK, uh, ads from McDonald's. It really just helped immerse you in the time period and kind of tell you everything that was happening in 1962. Um, during this Cold War period, she does really capture the fear that a lot of the kids felt, but also the need for just the day to day. Um, so I think that if your kiddo really enjoyed Countdown, they'll enjoy Shooting the Moon by Frances O'Rourke Powell. And that one is set during the Vietnam War, um, but it's still about young girls from military families who are trying to navigate this new emotional social landscape. I think they'll also enjoy Cold War on Maplewood Street by Gail Rosengren. And that is another kind of middle grade girls dealing with fear during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I did show you some photos from this one and let me read you a little bit from Franny's voice from chapter one to give you a hint of what this one reads like. I'm 11 years old and I am invisible. I'm sitting at my desk in my classroom on a perfect autumn afternoon, Friday, October 19th, 1962. My desk is in the farthest row next to the windows. I squint into the sunshine and watch a brilliant gold leaf fall from a spindly old tree by the sidewalk. And then I open Makers of America to page 47 because it's social studies time. I love social studies, love everything about it, and most of all, I love to read aloud. Mrs. Rodriguez, my teacher, has skipped me twice this week, twice, when we read out loud during social studies, going down each row, desk after desk. I am determined to not let that happen again. That kind of gives you an idea of Franny's personality. She's real spunky, um, pretty outspoken when she needs to be, but also kind of still has that shy reticence of being a young preteen. All right, so our next one, is also a historical novel, but this time we're taking it further back into the 1800s. So this one is called Show Me a Sign um, by Anne Claire Lazotte. This is level 5.1 and is worth seven points. And this one was a really interesting read. It's very, again, a different, unusual type of narrative structure than the verse poetry of Jazz Owls and the documentary novel of Countdown. This one, uh, the main protagonist, her name is Mary Lambert. She is deaf, she's from Martha's Vineyard. And I, in the 1800s, Martha's Vineyard had more deaf, deaf people than anywhere else in the United States. Um, and they had their own form of sign language called Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, where it was a lot of not only using signs, but also body language, emotion, facial expressions, and um, just kind of even vocalizations to express what you wanted to say. And she does a really cool job of trying to incorporate the differences between spoken language 
and sign language. Um, but this, it is about Mary and she lives on Martha's Vineyard with her parents. Her brother George just passed away. So the whole family is still kind of dealing with this trauma and Mary is dealing with a lot of guilt over the death of her brother because she thinks that she perchance had something to do with it. Uh, I'm not gonna go too far into that because it is a great book and I don't wanna spoil it for you. But uh, a new man comes to town, his name is Andrew Noble and he purports himself to be a scientist and he wants to study why there are so many deaf inhabitants on Martha's Vineyard. It, what, if anything, is causing their deafness? Is it something that is uh, biological? Is it genetic? Is it something more physical, like food that, they grow, that they're growing in the soil? Things like that. Uh, and it turns out he's not such a great guy. He kidnaps Mary to use her as a live specimen to kind of figure out exactly what's happening. It does end up on a more hopeful note than that. She does manage to escape. I'm not gonna give you the details because I do think you should read this one. It's really unique. It's not like any other middle grade I've read thus far. So I'm gonna give you a little hint about what this is like. Um, I'm gonna read from the prologue this time. If you are reading this, I suppose you want to know more about the terrible events of last year, which I almost didn't survive, and the community where I live. Every small village must think itself perfectly unique. I know there was not another like ours in America in the year of our Lord, 1805. For those who take hearing and speaking for granted, our way of life may be hard to understand. You may be fooled into believing that Chilmark on Martha's Vineyard, an island south of Boston, is a fancy of my imagination, or the lost paradise that the English captain who named the land after his daughter was seeking long ago. I've tried to be true to every detail and do justice, not only to my friends and family, but also to my enemies. It was the stranger invited to our shores who changed my view forever. I warn you, there are accounts of great wickedness along with hope in these pages, which I feel like that really does sum up the novel. The prologue is written um, kind of by a future Mary, uh, recounting the, event, the events of what happened during this particular time period. If your kiddo really enjoyed Show Me a Sign, uh, I think they'll also enjoy Wonderstruck by Brian Selznick, which is in of itself an unusual narrative format, also has to do with a deaf protagonist. Um, and it is kind of a, almost like a movie novel where it's a graphic novel with different textual elements. Um, but it's about a character journeying away from home. In that case, she ran away from home whereas Mary was kidnapped from her home. I think they'll also enjoy Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. And that's an, a contemporary novel about a deaf heroine and their journey to communicate. In Song for a Whale, the protagonist is trying to communicate with a whale who doesn't communicate with other whales. All right, so we're moving kind of out of the historical fiction and we're gonna go to a contemporary. Uh, this one is called Dress Coded by Carrie Firestone. This one was pretty darn cute and was a really fun read. It is level 4.8 and is worth eight points. So this dress coded is about a young girl named Molly who is an eighth grader in middle school and she decides to take it upon herself that she is gonna fight their school dress code. One of her friends got in trouble. She got dress coded as they call it by a uh, lady they refer to as fingertip because she's constantly um, measuring people's uh, straps of their shirts by her fingertips. And her friend got in trouble and dress coded and blamed basically for this eighth grade class not being able to go on their graduation trip. So she starts a podcast called Dress Coded a Podcast to talk about the school's dress code and how unfair it is and how they seem to be only targeting certain girls and not other girls who are wearing the same exact thing and also none of the boys. Um, this one it was very also unusual. It does go into, it does do the podcast format, but it also is told through lists 
letters, um, text messages sometimes. It has a really large cast of characters. Uh, I think that Carrie Firestone did a great job of kind of portraying almost the entire middle school, um, which was cool because there is a huge cast of characters and every one of them is very relatable. Uh, it's a very diverse cast of characters as well, which was really fun to read. So I'm going to read you a little bit from the first podcast episode that she does. My name is Molly Frost, and this is episode one of Dress Coded, a podcast. The real story behind the dress code disaster at Fisher Middle School. The whole incident happened in the Fisher Flower Garden, right next to the Mountain of Kindness Rocks, Mrs. Tucker's pet project. I was there. I saw the whole thing. And now I'm sitting here with Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Do you want to give the background? You can give the background, Molly. Are you sure? It's your story. You were a witness. Okay. Well, it began last Wednesday. I woke up late in a panic because I was already missing first period and my mom was at an appointment. So I had to cut through the woods to the back path of our school where I got to the garden, which for you non-Fisher listeners was planted to honor the six Fisher graduates who died in wars. I stopped to tie my shoe. I looked up and that's when I saw you standing in front of Mr. Dern and Dr. Couchman. I still remember Dr. Couchman's face was bright red and Mr. Dern was pointing his finger at you and you were crying. Silence. That does kind of give you a really good idea of Molly's voice. She is also a super, super spunky, plucky character. And I feel like a character a lot of young girls will really look up to and aspire to be. Uh, she fights for what she believes is right and doesn't take no for an answer. So I think if you enjoyed Dress Coded, you'll enjoy A Good Kind of Trouble by Lisa Moore Renee. It's an also an issue driven book that deals with complex issues in middle school. In a good uh, kind of trouble, it deals with Black Lives Matter, whereas Dress Coded deals with a dress code at a middle school. I think they'll also enjoy Post It by John David Anderson. And that is another kind of school policy focused read um, where students are trying to fight a cell phone ban that's caused an upheaval in the school. All right, so our next one, moving along, is very, very different. This one is probably the most unique middle grade novel I've read thus far. It's called Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story by Daniel Nairi. And this one is a fiction, but also kind of a bi an autobiography by the author. The main character is named Daniel. He is from Persia, modern day Iran. Uh, his real name is Kusro, but nobody can pronounce it. So he changes his name to have an American name and he picks Daniel. Um, and he tells his tale very, very much like a thousand and one nights. So he kind of has a thousand and one tales about his life and some of it kind of weaves in and out of a fairy tale or a fantasy and some of it is more straightforward. Uh, it's very, very lyrical and very beautiful. He does a great job of capturing the storytelling of A Thousand and One Nights and how important storytelling is for Daniel, the main character, to kind of keep his memories alive. Uh, he has, he's struggling with forgetting his childhood in Iran uh, where he grew up before they moved to Oklahoma. He's struggling to remember his grandparents and people who meant a lot to him and also stories that he had heard before. So he's kind of telling these tales in order to remember. So I will read you a little bit from the beginning of Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story. All Persians are liars and lying is a sin. That's what the kids in Mrs. Miller's class think, but I'm the only Persian they've ever met, so I don't know where they got that idea. My mom says it's true, but only because everyone has sinned and needs God to save them. My dad says it isn't. Persians aren't liars. They're poets, which is worse. Poets don't even know when they're lying. They're just trying to remember their dreams. They're trying to remember 6,000 years of history and all the versions of all the stories ever told. In one version, maybe I'm not the refugee kid in the back of Mrs. Miller's class. I'm a prince in disguise. If you catch me, I will say 
what they say in the 1001 nights. Let me go and I will tell you a tale passing strange. That's how they all begin, with a promise. If you listen, I'll tell you a story. We can know and be known to each other, and then we're not enemies anymore. I'm not making this up. This is a rule that even genies follow. In the 1001 Nights, Scheherazade, the rememberer of all the world's dreams, told stories every night to the king so he would spare her life. I think that's a really nice representation of the lyrical quality of this novel. This one is a little bit of a denser read, um, definitely a little bit on the older spectrum. It did win the Michael Prince Award for fiction, well-deserved. Um, but I think if your kids kind of enjoy more of a magical realism touch, they'll really enjoy that. I think if they did enjoy Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story, they'll also enjoy Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga. And that is another tale about immigrating to a new culture and trying to forge a new sense of identity. I think they'll also enjoy The Land of Forgotten Girls by Erin and Trotta Kelly. And that one is another tale where stories are central to the lives of the kids depicted in them. Um, in Everything Sad is Untrue, it's as a memory, a way to preserve memories. And in The Land of Forgotten Girls, it's kind of a way to escape their current environment. All right, we read a lot of books this time. We only got three left. All right, so the next one, again, is on the older scale. This one was great, can't go wrong with the amazing Jason Reynolds. This is called Long Way Down, and it's another novel in verse. This one is told um, in an elevator. So the, story, the whole story only takes place over just 60 seconds in seven floors. So the main character in Long Way Down, Will, is really grieving over the death of his brother. His brother was murdered by another person and Will takes it upon himself to kind of follow a credo that he and his brother had for revenge. So he is determined to get revenge on the person he believes killed his brother. So he goes in this elevator with that purpose. He has his brother's gun and he is ready to get his revenge. And as he goes down the elevator floors, different people from his family uh, call them ghosts, call them conscience, whatever you'd like, kind of try and talk him out of it or give him a different perspective. This one is different from all of the ones that we're going to read this time in that it has an extremely open-ended ending. The ending is really up to you. Uh, Will's fate is up for you to decide whether he decides to get his revenge or not. And this one is level 4.3 and is worth two points. So I'm just gonna read, this one is also really beautiful. It's composed of longer and shorter poems. Um, I'll read, let's see, the very beginning. It's called Don't Nobody Believe Nothing These Days, which is why I haven't told nobody the story I'm about to tell you. And truth is, you probably ain't gonna believe it either. Going to think I'm lying or I'm losing it. But I'm telling you, the story is true. It happened to me, really, it did. It so did. My name is Will, William, William Holloman. But to my friends and people who know me, know me, just Will. So call me Will, because after I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you'll either want to be my friend or not want to be my friend at all. Either way, you'll know me, know me. This one was a really powerful read. I really enjoyed the open-ended aspect of it. I think if your kiddo does enjoy Long Way Down, they'll enjoy Solo by Kwame Alexander. And that one is also a novel in verse where protagonists are dealing with life-altering questions. Um, I think they'll also enjoy Punching the Air by Ibi Zaboy. And that is another novel about grappling with the consequences of violence. All right, two more, we're almost there. So our next one up is Alone by Megan E. Freeman. This is a pretty new one. It doesn't have an AR rating yet, but it is for grades five through eight. Um, this one is about a young girl named Maddie who has kind of a failed sleepover. She was planning the sleepover with her friends. It didn't happen. So she goes to her grandparents' cabin all by herself. And when she wakes up, 
Everyone's been evacuated. There's nobody left in her town. She's on her own. The only companion she has is a Rottweiler named George. And she's on her own for about three years as she struggles to survive in her new circumstances. This one was really awesome. It was very different. And it's interesting to see how Ma uh, Maddie grow up throughout the pages. So she gets more and more mature as the story goes along. I'll read you a little bit from the beginning. Uh, this is a novel told in verse as well. This is not adolescent hyperbole. This is my reality. Alone in this place where I've been surviving on my own for over three years with no one but a big smelly Rottweiler who farts and hogs the covers. You might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. I'm not just being dramatic, like my grandma might say. I figured by the time I was a teenager, I'd be thinking about getting my driver's permit, going to dances, playing varsity soccer, and kissing. But instead, I'm thinking about where to find food and fuel and water and whether to use Mountain Dew to force flush the toilet or to drink even though it's the color of radioactive urine and it's probably toxic when ingested over long periods of time. Better to be radioactive or dehydrated? There, these are the questions that plague my daily existence, at least for now, at least until my parents come back. This one is pretty stark for a while. It does actually have a happy ending, which surprised me a little bit in a good, pleasant way. I think if your kiddo did enjoy Alone, they'll enjoy Wildfire by W.R. Philbrick. And Wildfire is another fast-paced survival story about escaping a wildfire in Maine. I think they'll also enjoy The Canyon's Edge by Dusty Bowling. And that one is yet again another survival story with a girl protagonist who is on their own in Arizona. All right, so our last unusual narrative of April is Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You uh, by Jason Reynolds. It's based on the longer adult novel Stamped from the Beginning by Im Ibram X. Kendi. And this one is unusual in its narrative format because it's a history book that's not a history book. Um, Jason Reynolds can do no wrong in my book. He tells the story of racism in America from the 1400s all the way through to the present in such a way that you are absolutely captivated and it doesn't feel like, again, it's not a history book that's not a history book. I read this in one sitting. I could not stop reading it. He told me a lot of things that surprised me um, and a lot of things I didn't know, which I always enjoy learning. Um, I would recommend this book to middle graders grades seven through 12. It is level 7.4 and is worth six points. Um, but again, it's such a delightfully easy read, even though he's going over such huge swaths of history. Um, and so I will read you a little bit from the beginning. It's chapter one, the story of the world's first racist. Before we begin, let's get something straight. This is not a history book. I repeat, this is not a history book at least not like the ones you're used to reading in school. The ones that feel more like a list of dates, though there will be some, with an occasional war here and there, a declaration, definitely gotta mention that, a constitution, that too, a court case or two, and of course the paragraph that's read during Black History Month, Harriet Rosa Martin. This isn't that. This isn't a history book, or at least it's not that kind of history book. Instead, what this is, is a book that contains history. A history directly connected to our lives as we live them, right this minute. This is a present book, a book about the here and now, a book that hopefully will help us better understand why we are where we are as Americans, specifically as our identity pertains to race. This was a great book. It'd be a great conversation starter in a classroom or in a home environment um, to talk about current events, uh, and past events. If your kiddo really enjoyed stamps, I think that they will also enjoy. This book is Anti-Racist by Tiffany Jewell. It's another thought-provoking book um, that presents past and present ideologies of racism and how readers can take anti-racist action in their own lives. So that, were, that was our lineup of books that we read 
for the month of April. We read a total of eight books. I will just give you the rundown of those titles one more time. So we read Jazz Owls, Countdown, Show Me a Sign, Dress Coded, a, um, Everything Sad is Untrue, A True Story, Long Way Down, Alone, and Stamped. So next month for May, our next chapter book club is going to focus on summer reading for just to get kind of amped up for summer reading and get ready. So our theme for summer reading, which starts June 1st, is Tales and Tales. So we're going to feature a lot of tales, T-A-L-E-S, that maybe feature tales, T-A-I-L-S, or are just tales to be told. So I hope you'll join me then. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you later.